Director of Photography John Seal conducted a three-day lighting workshop with the cinematography students of the Australian Film, Television and Radio School soon after shooting Dead Poets Society for Peter Weir. The photography of Dead Poets Society illustrates only in part what makes John Seal an inspirational and inspired cinematographer. His planning and pre-production, fast and inventive work on set, control over the film medium and personality all distinguish his approach. John reinvents himself with every new project he takes on. He won't impose his own cinematic style, but prefers to work closely with the director to enhance the narrative, thematic and emotional aspects of the piece, believing his role is to make films, not just beautiful pictures. He emphasised that we as cinematographers need to understand what the film is doing to the audience, rather than what the lighting might be doing. John is both sensitive to the needs of the drama and efficient in how he shoots it. He works with great speed and ingenuity to achieve the maximum number of setups, allowing the director maximum control later in the editing. It's John's wealth of knowledge and experience that allow him to achieve cinematic excellence. I think it's very difficult when you're learning that there is a ladder to climb or there's a hill to climb towards what what we might call perfection. There is no perfection, I don't think, in, in film work because every film's different, every shot's different. You, you can't ha really have perfection. Um, but there is, in the learning business, that you're learning to get to a certain point uh, of expertise, maybe one might say. Then, once you've learnt that, then the, the quicker you can fall down the other side of the hill and start making films for the director, the, the better off you are. John chose a particular set from Dead Poets Society which allowed total lighting control and offered much scope for exploring and developing our technical expertise. Well, it was an awkward little set in the actual filming. Um, it's very small and compact and had had, had uh, dorme windows which created a few little problems in lighting that might not have occurred in a simpler set. And I thought that there were, there were different uh, climatic conditions really, like snow and night. Uh, day and, and things that we could do out the windows. The smallness of the set ca caused problems. We, I mean, we did 360 degree pans inside that little set. Um, and obviously you can't fly walls for a 360, so you're stuck inside the, the reality of the, the set. And um, so I thought if we did that uh, and then watched the film, then we could see how the problems uh, occurred by using the little set, how we lit it, and then watch the film to see how it came out. A replica of the small dormitory set was built in the school studio. It had a floating wall along one side and a scenic flat was placed outside the window. The set was three metres in height, three metres wide and four metres in length. In the first setup, the objective was to shoot late afternoon. The scene was changed from its original season in the film to summer to give us more to work with and to allow us to shape the mood of the scene more definitively. The action was staged by the window so that our stand-ins for the workshop were also lit as if by the last rays of afternoon sun coming in through the window and bouncing around the room. The scenic flat was brought into position outside the window and was lit by two 5K lights. Another 5K was pointed through the window, creating the effect of late afternoon rays entering the room. This one, mate. We can, we can frame this one, like whack the frame in as close as you can to this, and bring it straight out there, right, and get this in on the angle so it blows in really soft. I'll leave that one direct at the moment. This 5K was set behind a diffuser screen to achieve a softer light, striking the wall opposite. Is it right up now, Tony? No, leave it right up if you wouldn't. I was just wondering if it was right. Next, a 5k soft light was set above the window, pointing down towards the floor in the room. Just up there, washing a big soft light straight down through there. The ceiling was made of calico cloth, stretched tightly across the set, diffusing the light from two more 5k's shining into the room. The practical in the centre was lit throughout this scene. With so many lights to balance and measure, setting an exposure can be a daunting prospect. Is that all right? Um, I'm not sure. Some people will try and split it, like, you know that? Yeah. You see, which is pretty accurate. I mean, you end up about four, really. But if you're reading that there, you know, you're 2-8. Mm. Yeah, but some people read, like, want to read 
a bit of that and a bit of that, right? Mm. So depending on what you've got, you can get anything a damn line. But what's the best way to get? Just well, I, I just I read them all separately. Yeah. So I know what that lamp there is doing, or what this low, glow is here. Right? If you've got, if you get a reading from here, yeah. and it's half two to eight, yeah. and then go from here, yeah. it says it's the same, but it's not really giving all that light. Like that but that's good because you've got a constant fill side, and what you've got to do then is go on your fill. Mm. There's always light on your fill. Yeah, but. How much can be more light than this way? Yeah, but that's a backlight, you see, so it'll highlight. You can let that burn out. Yeah. It's how far underexposed you want this side. Is, is the key to it. I mean, you would never expose for half two and two eight here. Because only Because you'd wash out all this, you'd have no depth in here, you know. So I think on the 96 you can push it down, you know, rating it at 400 ASA, you can probably push it down for your mood. Whatever mood, see this is now sunset, see how much warmer that is when we've mm, got that. Yeah. So that this light up here, which I always figure is on all the time, because it's quite nice in an institution that you, it's dark enough, in other words, you underexpose your mm. fuel side to the point where it doesn't matter what time of the day it is, these little, this is the only source of daylight in the room yeah. that you have to have practically on. Yeah. It gives you nicer things to play with, you know. Mm. As you can imagine somebody, you know, say sitting at this desk here, there, you know what I mean? You can do amazing things with a, with a light like that and still have daylight. Mm -hmm. It's logical, you know. But as long as you pull down the whole room to say that it is logical, yeah. that's what. Or that's why it's really most of it's what your eye sees, what you want to see. You know? What you want to see is important in developing a lighting scheme or an approach. John emphasised the importance of planning the approach, explaining that if you haven't thought of it in pre-production, you won't have time to think of it during the shoot. Once on the set, you have to work at such speed that without the preliminary groundwork, the film and the shoot will be compromised. You have to walk onto the set with at least an idea of how you're going to deal with a particular scene. Being prepared also allows you to deal with problems that inevitably arise. In this instance, as in the film, the light on Stephen is very flat. Sometimes you, you can get caught like this, and it's not bad to get caught, I mean, you know. It is reality, it's just that he's dead flat. There's nothing, the walls either side of him are the same density because it's such a flat light, you know, and you can't, you can't really get in any colours or anything up there to try and knock that wall down because it's such a soft source, not a direct light, so you can't cut that wall off so it's a different density to that wall. So you're ending up in this awfully flat situation. The only thing that did happen, I remember on the picture, we were getting that, you see that there? Which was a little more intense, because we, we can spot that up and go for that. And he had a white, a very white sheet. In fact, we replaced it and cheated on the inside. So that if he, if he holds it at the right angle, in the sun there like that, you can get, you can even see it there, it's not much, but you imagine with a white sheet of paper, that he got a little glow underneath, kicked in the eyes and things like that. And that we managed to get, but once again in a wide two shot, you're not going to see. So you sort of bite the bullet and think, oh, well, when we do the close up, we'll, make, we'll really go for broke and all that. Next, we moved in on a close up of Warren. John chooses to keep the stop constant for the duration of the scene so that the negative density doesn't change. He controls the intensity, quality and direction of light by adjusting the lamps themselves to achieve the desired exposure. The backlight is way over. John just let it skim and burn, having decided he was after an effect of the last rays of sun. The soft light on the key side of his face was increased, just so that it wrapped around a bit and was more dramatic. Once again, he stressed the importance of controlling the fill light to balance the exposure. Oh, that looks great. <laughs> Normally he would have used a pen of light, but improvised with an inky on this occasion. At first, the subtle fill was difficult to see against the strong backlight. So if you knock out all the backlight and you're just looking at Warren's face, you can see the difference. I find it very handy. If you look through your, if you look through your uh, uh, rolled up fingers like that, <laughs> if, if you're 
seeing a little lamp like this. If you let a backlight like that shine into your eyes, you're going to stop down. And also, on sets, it's good to wear hats because you knock out all that hot light up the top because that's stopping your eyes down. You see, and you look here and you let that backlight hit you in the eye and you're trying to check a fill side. It's hopeless because your eyes stop down, it looks twice as dark as it should be. So all you do is you just, you just look through the black of the tunnel of your fingers at, at uh, Warren's face and what happens is your eye opens up and you can see what the film's going to see. Okay, just a rehearsal and action. John locks in the lighting at the final rehearsal. He feels that making adjustments between takes is both detrimental to continuity and disruptive for the actors. Where some DOPs use the first few takes as their own final rehearsals, John believes take one to be the most important to get right while the energy is up. For him, every take is a print take. In the second setup, we were challenged by a 360 degree pan. In Dead Poet Society, the lamps above the calico were snooted to simulate a pool of light as if emanating from the practical hanging from the ceiling. They come around into there, obviously, but that's the back of their heads. The front, we've had to close that down a bit so they're not getting quite as much fill as you normally, because of the, off the top of the set, you know. But um, pretty, yeah, even, even in that, like there, they're on aperture and here they're not, you know. But they're silhouetted one and a half over on the top. Two eight. Andy, you right yeah. to go? Set. And action. Let's have a look. <laughs> go on to Steve. And let him out of frame. Cut. Good one. How was that? Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. All right. Yeah. Yeah. They all say yes. 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 In the third setup, the room is lit for a winter day. The mood is more subdued. The room is still lit as if through the window, but it's a cool, dark day. There are no piercing rays of sun, and the interior light is switched off. Where previously the window was burning out, obscuring the exterior, here we wanted to see more detail outside the window. We kill that prey. That's better. That's great. See how soft that is now coming back in on here and it's over there. Looking at you want the back light on the backdrop or the backlight? Um, we can reduce whatever lights on the backdrop, mate. Okay. Keep bring it right back. Okay. I'll leave that soft light back here too, mate. The basic position of the lights remained the same as for the previous setup. The 5K to the right of the window was brought in closer and was set behind a diffuser screen. You spot that up a touch, mate, just to drive that through a little more. Yeah, just a little hotter on his uh, face. To create the coolness of winter light, blue gels were applied to the lamps. Half blue gels on the two 5Ks on the flat, quarter blue on the other two 5Ks and on the soft light pointed through the window. The ceiling practical was turned off so that only one 5K diffused through the calico ceiling filled the room. A 1K soft light spilled in through the door simulating electric light in an adjoining hallway. The soft light being less than 3,200 degrees Kelvin, was about a quarter more red, casting a warm light. John believes it's wise to be subtle with colour balance during the shoot, so as to allow greater control and flexibility later in the grade. He cautioned that if you go too far in one direction in the negative, you can be trapped, unable to get rid of it later in the print. this one as a, as a first example, right? And then we'll put this little thing on the front here. Action. The overall effect is sombre, a bleak cold exterior contrasting with a low-key warmer interior. Having shot this control shot, John decided he wanted to reduce the amount of light at the window okay. without affecting the now quantity of light coming gel. through it into the room. To illustrate the principle involved, John cut a 0.3 piece of neutral density gel to correspond with the shape of the window when fixed in front of the lens.
Here, we asked the actor to walk through the shot to highlight the area covered by the gel. Originally, this effect was specifically designed for a static shot so that the filter is totally unnoticeable. In the fourth setup, the action involving both our characters in two shot will take place in the doorway. The room had to appear to be lit by the overhead electric light. This time there was no light coming from the window, only a suggestion of moonlight outside. At first, the moonlight presented a problem in that it was lighting the backdrop, so this was moved away from the set. The soft light above the window was gelled with a full blue this time. The two desk lamps set by the door were further enhanced by two 300 watt Mizar lamps set alongside. Again, one 5K light above the ceiling provided most of the interior light, and a 1K soft light outside the door provided the spill from the hallway. Every lighting setup is founded on the visual logic established by the practicals or light sources shown in the scene. The light source, for instance, a desk lamp or a street light, will dictate the direction and quality of light. The light in the room was graded so that the back of the room is darker than the front, where the action takes place. That poly, mate, we might just throw that on the ceiling. Slide it towards the light source. A piece of polystyrene foam was used to cover about a third of the calico in the area above the window. Parallel that way. Right. And just uh, fringe it on about a third of the calico that's lit, would you mind? Grading the room gave the space more depth and a greater sense of realism. Good. Maybe it comes out might get another job. <laughs> Grab uh, Warren. Warren. Warren will end up about here. Yep. What lens you got on the AD? At the moment, yes. Do you want something different? Maybe a little tighter, a little longer. So we just compress. If we bring uh, Steve from here, as though he's sitting there in misery bag, you know. If he walks forward, we just compress the rather than use the short lens, use the slightly longer one and. Press it up a little. You might have to go back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. But as long as, if with Warren, we end up with a nice tight shot here, so that as the boy leaves, yep. he can go bang into the lens for that dramatic moment. Yeah. Or John, words to that effect. This light here is that filling with just Warren or Stephen as well? This lamp? Yeah. It's really for Stephen here. There's a little glow up there because, you know, with with Warren so close in, in foreground with the back of his head, mm -hmm. it's not. There's no real effect on him. We had that one lined up for Warren, you see. But sometimes when you get a situation with two people in shot and you backlight both, three-quarter backlight, right? The old-fashioned way, looks dreadful. John has chosen to kick up the backlight on Stephen, camera left, a little more than the one on Warren. John showed us one of his unconventional techniques, which allowed us to backlight two people in a very confined space. Is put two people here, right, just to and show that like you can't get a backlight on them. But if we could, if we could put an inky up there, clamp it onto there, and hang it down, right, right. Oh, and then yes, we'll, yes. We, what we'll do is then block it out with this foreground piece, and that show how we can light these two. Whereas normally you couldn't get a lamp straight through the window. Yeah because that'll be the hot spot. We might just steam up, I think, that backdrop just a little bit. Following John's instructions, yeah. a piece of board was painted precisely the same colour as the walls of the room. Then an inky was attached to the wall and gelled with a quarter 85. The painted board was carefully positioned in front of the lens, aligned so that it obscured the inky on the wall and also lined up with the lines above the dorm window, which helped to further disguise the board. Already. Finally, the board was lit to match the exposure and density of the back wall. 
Anyway, that's the idea. Um, yeah, if somebody would like, like to have a look through there, that's the ceiling piece. That's it there. As impressive as these techniques are, for John, they're only a means to an end, and he'll use any technique that's appropriate to the film he is making. Uh, like on dead parts, I used a hydraulic head the whole time on the operating, and I had my hand on the zoom the whole time and shot it like a newsreel. Because when somebody moves, you know, like across the room or something, you can just ease in on them during the move, nobody ever sees the zoom. It's when you, I think when you see a zoom that people hate zooms. But, but when you hide it totally, you know, if somebody's move, a lift, a sit, a stand, uh, they become an excellent tool of trade. And I, I don't think they'd be frightened off. Some people say the quality's not as good, but why worry about quality if you're going to make a better film because you've got the versatility of uh, a lot more focal length lenses. What allows John to be so confident? How did he gain such control over the medium? I think the one light print is, um, that we have in Australia is one of the most important tools of the, of the learning cameraman's trade because if the lab is going to keep a one light print on all of his processing and, uh, and on your prints, then you know exactly where your negative is at when you start shooting with it. You know exactly where your meter is at as far as you, you know, setting the ASA on your meter and then exposing that negative, um, you know that with the one light print that you can change the negative to find out what the, what the, uh, the print will do, you see. But, uh, and then you find out where your head's at. So then you know how far you can underexpose, how far you can overexpose the negative. If you have a graded work print and learn on a graded work print, then obviously you, if you underexpose, somebody might print it back up again. So then you, you're nebulous as far as knowing where your underexposure or your overexposure is. Therefore, you can never really work out your contrast range because your, your, your centre line of printer lights are fluctuating all the time to correct a little bit of too much underexposure or too much overexposure. So I found in, in America that you know, shooting there with, with graded uh, prints is, is, if you were learning, you'd never know how far you can go under or how far you can go over and therefore put the two together and then slide the aperture up and down to suit that contrast range. Uh, whereas here in Australia, one of, our, one of our best tools is the fact that it is a constant one light work print set by the laboratories and, and Kodak, I understand, um, to a, I think an SMPTE uh, level. Um, and you can change that. I mean, it's not to say that it's gospel that it's gonna run about the 27s or 28s. You can actually re-rate the film down and set your own set of printer lights as a one light print to say middle 30s, which is always pretty good for your blacks and things like that. So what you're doing is derating the film, knowing that you're overexposing, so you get a good healthy negative, and then you're printing down with the 35s so that you're crushing your blacks and getting good blacks. Now you can do that, and that becomes a one light print. Uh, as long as, um, obviously you do this in very close liaison with the lab, so that then they know that your printer lights are set at somewhere around the middle 30s. Uh, in America, they, they, they do push for that. You, you do end up derating so you can get up around the, the middle 30s, say, on the print lights. Um, but then they start grading within the, that 30 to 40 range. You're going to be learning on, on basically low budget films that are shot in a very short time. So that, that confidence from the, the four elements of, of cinematography locked into your brain enables you to shoot good pictures very quickly. In other words, you're thinking ahead, you're not worried about um, any variables, you know, within the laboratory or your, your meter, your head or your, your negative, so that you can approach shooting a picture in a very rapid manner and be confident and it will come out. It's a learning process so that once you, you know you can look at a face and you can say, oh, the key light is, is one and a half stops over approximately and your eye says that to you. Once again, there's no variables, you see, you can't have the variables. So you can learn very quickly that a key light's one and a half over. It means then you can look at magazines and you can think, gosh, that effect's nice. That looks as though it's about two over there and one and a half under there, and you lock that in. And you can sort of analyse how somebody else did something. You can go to the movies and analyse how they did it and think, gosh, that looked good. But because you've got that knowledge of the, the value of the light, i.e. by exposure and, a, and an f-stop number, then um, you can then analyse other people's films 
you can say, gee, that looks about two under, looked good, you know. So next time you go out shooting, you can say, I'll make it two under and be bold and brave and confident in that decision. This continual search for, for um, technical perfection sometimes restricts the making of the film. And, and, uh, and that, that is unavoidable when you're learning because you think, oh gosh, that back wall's too hot or that's too far underexposed, I'll have to light that and then I'll have to trim that. And, and in the end, you, you take so long to do this technical thing that the film is being forgotten. But as you learn, more and more and become more and more confident with the technical ability that you're learning, then you, then you realise, no, let it go, don't worry about that, no, forget that. Um, same with operating, say combined with the lighting side of it, you might have a little bump in the middle of uh, a shot uh, and you listen to the way the director says cut and if he says cut in a sort of an up happy mood you know he's got the performance, then you have to decide in your mind in the early days of learning you'd say no, 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 I'll have to go again at a big bump in the middle. When you do learn the technical um, uh, limitations um, and expertise comes in, you forget the bump because the director got the performance. So it's little things like that to, 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 to attain the technical capability as quickly as possible and then throw it all away and start making films.